pleasure now is to introduce Sakib Bharti, yeah. the Member of Parliament for Merid the Meriden constituency. There was a time when the Meriden constituency was the number one swing constituency in the United Kingdom. Whichever party won Meriden, they also won the keys to number 10. However, things have changed. And Sakib was elected in December 2019 with a majority of 22,836 votes. And by the way, in being selected as the Conservative candidate for Meriden, he overcame a challenge from Nick Timothy, Theresa May's former political advisor. Well done. <laughs> this morning our conference began with an address by Bill Cash, who had been a who's been a member of parliament for 36 years. And we're ending our conference now with an address by Sakib, who's been a member of parliament for three months. <laughs> Quite a time span. But I know that they were both equally determined that we secure a clean Brexit. Sakib has quite a lot going for him as he is by profession an accountant like myself. <laughs> During the referendum campaign he was Joint Secretary General of Muslims for Britain. Sakib is also well entrenched in the West Midlands business community having served as President of the Greater Birmingham Chamber of Commerce and has subsequently been appointed a member of the Order of the British Empire for services to diversity and inclusion in the business community. Ladies and gentlemen, will you please give a very warm welcome to Sakib Bharti, Member of Parliament. Thank you, uh, Chairman, for that lovely introduction, and I, I'll t I take heed of your uh, time requirements. I was going to talk about the EU free trade deal agreement, but since I've been uh, ripped it apart there, I, I, I might be a lot shorter. <laughs> um, I, I, well, I am pleased that I can stand here as the Member of Parliament for Meriden, and, and my majority was 22,836, uh, but Habib, I think I give the Prime Minister a lot more credit than you are giving at the moment, because I think I got the last 836 and he got the first 22,000. Um, I want to thank the Bruges Group for the invitation. It's a real pleasure and a privilege to be here to talk about Brexit. Um, and I am going to talk about my journey uh, a little bit here, because I think uh, it feeds into uh, what the Chairman just spoke about. I mean, when Bill Cash entered Parliament, I was minus two years old. Uh, so uh, I, 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 pay, I pay tribute to all those uh, people who fought for this journey. Um, uh, and I'm, I'm a lot more optimistic uh, than Habib was, but I acknowledge the, the credit you gave to, to, to the party uh, in, in terms of our negotiation. Um, one of the great things about being a new member of parliament, you heard uh, Dr. Julian Lewis talk about an MP accosting him in the toilet, so luckily that was before my time. Uh, <laughs> that wasn't me. Um, I am by background a ch uh, chartered accountant, um, and I was president of the Greater Bir Birmingham Chambers of Commerce, so I will be talking about some of the impact on, on the West Midlands as a region, as you well know, is going through a, a renaissance, and I was lucky enough to be the youngest ever. The Birmingham Chambers of Commerce, one of the original chambers, um, uh, set up over 200 years ago. Um, I also had the pleasure of being Deputy Chair of Andy Street's political uh, team. Um, and as you may well know, uh, Andy's doing a fantastic job in the West Midlands, and he's up for election recently. And I was Director of the Greater Birmingham and Solihull Local Enterprise Partnership pre-election, uh, responsible for business support, um, uh, which, uh, under my portfolio, we had the largest amount of startups setting up in Birmingham, um, uh, and the Greater Birmingham and Solihull area, which covers my area, uh, outside of London. And, and I often joke, we're also the, now the greatest importers of Londoners than anywhere else in the country. Um, but I was asked to talk about Brexit, so I'm going to uh, talk about my journey. Uh, and, and like uh, Julian there, um, you know, as I was growing up, I, I knew of the European Union, and I, I took my time trying to uh, understand what it was about. And to me, it was always an opaque institution. Um, uh, unlike my other half, who's here actually, who uh, became a Brexiteer at the age of 12. Um, and uh, you know, I have to pay tribute to all those uh, people who uh, have been fighting for this journey for so many years. Um, I think Ben, ben and Julian talked about uh, the past 
part of the European Union, and quite clearly uh, their journey uh, is separate to ours. Um, they're very clear in the way they want to go, and I, I think the uh, the most telling uh, report that I always refer to in, in, during the referendum, and I still do, is the Five Presidents report. I don't know if anyone's had a chance to read that, uh, but back in October 15, uh, they talked about, they set out their path to greater harmonisation and federalisation. And for me, the journey uh, throughout the Brexit campaign, throughout, throughout the referendum, with all the press and all the uh, scaremongering and all the other stuff that was going on, if I firmly held on to that because quite clearly it was a blueprint in terms of what they spoke about. And uh, Ben was completely right uh, about uh, talking about um, you know the things like oh them not wanting an EU army and things like that. And clearly we are seeing um, that as soon as the referendum happened, the, the rhetoric changed on its head. Um, for me, it was absolutely black and white, and as I'm sure it was for many in the room, that it makes absolutely absolute sense that we're free from the shackles uh, of a bureaucracy that is unaccountable. So I was incredibly proud to have played my part. Um, and I was pleased to have joined during the referendum campaign, the Vote Leave campaign. I was running the Vote Leave campaign in the West Midlands. Um, but the chairman referred to uh, Muslims for Britain. So I'm going to touch upon this uh, for a bit. Uh, because there is a fallacy uh, purported generally by uh, those in the Remain campaign and uh, on the left, that those, uh, and those who would like to undermine our cause, that leaving the EU was the preserve of something they like to call Little England, or small-minded anti-immigration pull up the drawbridge tribes. Um, there, was, there was nothing, they might be, uh, that was further from the truth. And I'm not just saying that as a form of rhetoric. It's something I lived and breathed uh, and uh, you know, we knocked on doors and we made the campaign for this. Um, and the idea for Muslims for Britain as one of the outreach groups that were set up during the Vote Leave campaign was to engage those moderate, uh, not just British Muslims, ethnic minorities uh, all across the country uh, to do that. And we estimate that by the time the referendum happened, we had a total of 800 thousand British Muslims who voted to leave a significant amount um, and uh, what I really wanted to do uh, was take a moment to focus on the messaging and why we were able to attract such a large audience uh, to uh, to the narrative that we put out there um, I was really keen I, you know I'm, I'm an optimistic guy by nature as you'll see later in the speech when I talk about the free trade agreements um, I was really keen to put out some really uh, optimistic uh, pro-conservative messaging out there uh, to talk about why leaving the European Union um, uh, was uh, beneficial not just to the rest of the country uh, and why we could fly high as Great Britain uh, but actually also uh, to some of the ethnic minority communities across the country and then we, we split this up into uh, five different points um, I'll start with the two that were most important to me um, we talk about taking back control and I know we've all, we've all heard the slogan but to, you know sovereignty was a key aspect um, and if you speak to my father for example who came to this country in 1968 from Pakistan the, a gentleman who who set up a business, who uh, never took a penny from the state, who, who came from Pakistan, who never ever would understand why we would give away so much sovereignty uh, to a neighbouring state. It just didn't make sense to him. Um, and, and what we uniquely found was actually this was a common experience up and down the country of people who've come and actually understood that. Um, immigration played a massive role as well. I, I remember during the campaign I had uh, Gary Gibbon from Channel 4 uh, come down um, and uh, we took, I took him to a very ethnically diverse area of Birmingham. Um, you know, it, it was one of those places that even I didn't know how this was going to play out. And 95% of the shopkeepers uh, on that road uh, were voting to leave. Um, and the reason? because they traded with Pakistan, with India, with Bangladesh, with China, you know, all countries you'll note that were outside of the European Union. Um, and all of a sudden I thought, hmm, this is interesting. We can certainly, uh, even around immigration, uh, we can start to talk about uh, a much more positive message. And actually what they wanted, they weren't trying to make an easier immigration system. They understood that a country must have control of its borders, as, uh, as the countries that they have left behind did. But actually what they understood was as well that actually it's got to be an equal system and a fair system um, you know and uh, it was quite often I would uh, quite stump those uh, remain supporting uh, MPs and activists when I used to talk about a fairer immigration system and talked about a two-tier immigration system where if you were where it was based on the color of the passport uh, rather uh, than uh, what someone would be able to bring uh, to the country of course then when you talk about the ethnic minority communities in the country as well, we talk uh, significantly uh, about those that are linked to the Commonwealth. And if you've walked past Parliament Square today, you will have seen the uh, the flags flying high. Um, frankly, you know, our, our, uh, our 
pivot towards the European Union uh, has meant that we did neglect uh, a, a population of two and a half billion and the opportunities that come. Um, and maybe it made sense uh, in the 70s and uh, when, when the journey started. But actually, when you look at the, some of the fastest growing economies in the world now um, uh, and our trade with those Commonwealth countries, uh, it is far, uh, starting to fast outpace that with the, uh, with the European Union. And if you look at the Commonwealth countries and their commonality with us, similar legal systems, uh, English as primary languages, it perfectly made sense. And I'm, I'm pleased that the government's uh, free trade agenda is aimed at a place like uh, Australia uh, and New Zealand. And then, of course, the free trade deals themselves, uh, which I will talk about in greater detail. And finally, We've talked earlier, uh, you know, I heard the speakers uh, talk to talk about the contribution to the world wars um, and uh, the way the parents uh, the, and grandparents have played a role in that. Well, we, we had, um, uh, had plenty of people talking about their ancestors fighting in the world, First World War and the Second World War. Over a million people in each uh, each time came to fight uh, for the defence uh, against uh, the the tyranny of Nazi uh, Germany. In fact, one of the pre the current president of the Muslim for Britain proudly uh, wears, every year wears his father's medals uh, that he won in terms of defending uh, peace uh, in Europe. And all of a sudden these five very simple points were we were able to take to the doorstep and engage different communities and start to talk about the experience um, uh, that they had and why actually being outside of the European Union uh, made absolute sense. So that was kind of my kind of uh, very fast kind of uh, summary of uh, the journey throughout the referendum. Um, but we fast forward three years, and on December the 13th, uh, the very first day I was elected as a member of parliament, uh, I think it's, it's fair to say the country that secured uh, has left us in a truly unique position. Uh, the British people, you guys, spoke very clearly and very resoundingly. I know you, you, we've been speaking very clearly and resoundingly for the last three years, but finally it was time to listen. Um, so I'm going to focus uh, on the potential of these free trade deals that we're pursuing. Um, and I talked about being a naturally uh, optimistic guy, so I might, I might contradict Ben in a few uh, places. But the UK stands at a very historic moment uh, with the ability to build its own independent trade policy. Um, I, by the way, I actually think Ben was right to be challenging uh, on some of our uh, trading principles, but actually my, I, I believe that we're in the midst of a negotiation. Um, and you know, it's good to have that shopping list and have those demands, actually, uh, to be able to uh, make sure that we we actually deliver on the vote uh, of 2016. We've always thrived as a free trading nation, and I know there are a plethora of deals spoken about, but I'm going to take a moment to talk about the EU-UK free tra trade deal and the US-UK free trade deal. And since I'm a West Midlands M uh, MP, what it means for the West Midlands, which is a prolific exporter of goods, uh, which normally has a trade surplus with the likes of China, uh, the latter of which, which is, uh, sorry, the, the, this one, which is, uh, we're the only region in the country to have one, and a trade surplus with the United States, America, given our history in manufacturing and the automotive sector. So, the EU free trade deal, on the 31st of January, the votes of over 17.5 million people were Im implemented, and we've embarked, and I agree with Ben on this, on the final leg of our journey towards our newfound independence. And as a sovereign, self-governing, independent nation, part of this now is that we have the ability to frame, uh, freedom to frame our new laws, have control of our borders, be free from in interference, uh, from unelected bureaucrats, and most importantly, we can now position ourselves in the world as we want to be without worrying about the 27 other nations with their varying economies, varying societal challenges, and obviously their varying priorities. And at the end of the transition period on the 31st of December, the Prime Minister has been very clear, we'll be recovering our economic and political independence. And I often said during the referendum, um, we're not floating off into the Atlantic, um, and I bear no ill will towards Europe. Uh, but we do have two separate journeys, and we have the right to carve out our own future. And to quote, quote Michael Gove just a couple of weeks ago, he said we want the best possible trading relationship with the European Union, but in pursuit of a deal, we will not trade away our sovereignty. And as I, I, you'll refer to those earlier points that I referred to, this was a key aspect of why I campaigned, uh, and indeed why I gave up my business life to enter the world of politics. 
And there's, for me, there's no reason why we can't secure a relationship based on friendly cooperation between sovereign equals. And it's pre perfectly reasonable to expect, ex expect the EU to accept our sovereignty and a distinctive legal order, as they would do with any other country that they've struck a free trade deal with. And I fully expect them to bargain hard and negotiate hard. That's their right. But it is our priority to do the same in return. And the fact that the EU has trade deals with nations across the world provides, for me, a menu of options that we can fashion our trade deal according to our needs. And the British people were clear, and I'm pleased that we will not be seeking to align with the EU rules on EU terms governed by EU laws and EU institutions. And Ben's absolutely right to focus on that, because that's exactly what we should be working to, to achieve. And, and there's much analysis of why uh, people voted to leave. And whether it was immigration or sovereignty or free trade or simply a desire for change, ultimately, for me, these were all expressions and symptoms of the expression of the desire for our laws to be made, scrutinised and upheld by British institutions and the individuals accountable to the British public. So that's what I'm going to say on the EU free trade deal because you know a negotiation is underway and I don't want to preempt that. But on the US free trade deal, which I'm particularly excited about, we have a similarly exciting opportunity to strike a free trade deal. Being a West Midlands MP, I'm going to just paint what this means for us, uh, to, uh, for the region, to give it a greater context. And as many of you will be aware, the West Midlands has been experiencing somewhat of a renaissance. Birmingham, if you've ever been, I don't know if any of you have uh, been able to visit Birmingham recently. If you haven't, you'll probably see it during conference. It's transformed physically uh, than uh, what it has been over the last 20 years. And it's got a, most importantly, it's got a newfound confidence. And the evidence shows that a US-UK FTA will be worth over three. £363 million to us. We currently export the equivalent of £12,633 worth of goods to the US every minute. Birmingham Bay Airport, which is based in Meriden, handles over £352 million worth of traded goods between the US and UK every year. And given the heritage of our automotive manufacturing sector, such a deal would reduce uh, tariffs by 2.5%. And this is on exports that represent over £4.3 billion currently. So I'm sure you'll agree there's actually quite a lot of opportunity there to be achieved. And the Prime Minister speaks of levelling up. And it's through ambitious free trade deals like this that we will benefit every part of Britain. And this is why I'm real, a real supporter of this, because this is the only way through free trade to be able to achieve this. And the US is one of our largest friends. It's one of the world's largest economies. It's one of our oldest allies. And it's, key, it's a key security and defence partner, as we heard earlier. So it makes absolute sense to me uh, that should, we should be having this ambition. In 2017, we had 1.7 million people work for US companies, and 1.3 million work for UK companies in the US. Anglo-American trade was approximately £221 billion, representing 20% of our exports. An ambitious free trade agreement with the US could deliver £15 billion more of bilateral trade, and a £3 billion lift to the economy. So those are some of the figures that give the underlying economic case for a US deal. But I was a chartered accountant who focused on small businesses and working with them. So I'm particularly excited by the small business chapter because uh, as far as I've always been concerned, and I did this as president of the chamber, was I said actually the real opportunity must be, the real opportunity must be to uh, be ambitious and try and get more of our SMEs uh, exporting. In 2018, 97% of our exporters were SMEs and over 30,000 SMEs across the UK already trade with the US. And slashing trade barriers with the US US would be worth around £493 million, pounds, and this would be transformative for our SMEs. The, the chapter on uh, SMEs will support everything from customs and trade facilitation to services to business mobility to telecommunications to digital trade and to uh, making intellectual property access more easier. And in my business life, an expert from DIT once said to me that only 40% of our small businesses are exporting. Those that could export are exporting. And I ask you to imagine what we could do if we could achieve, uh, if we could just move that dial even a little bit and make more of our SMEs uh, export, open up markets and create opportunities for our small businesses. Because when we talk about levelling up, those SMEs have to be right at the heart of our agenda. And so one thing I'm committed to doing is to champion those SMEs right during my career in Parliament. I believe our best years are ahead of us. And I know I said earlier that we're not swimming off into the Atlantic away from Europe, but I'm firmly of the belief that when we get this deal, and I'm confident that we will, we'll certainly be bringing the US a lot closer to us. 
Three years on after the democratic vote of 2016, we're now in a position to show just what the country uh, voted for, but also what we can show is to the world why we can stand proudly on the global stage and why we can be a global bastion for free trade and for democracy. Thank you so much for listening. I look forward to your